there. So welcome to this expert interview with Mr. Brian Michael Jenkins. Welcome. Thank you. We're very glad to have you with us today. And we uh, would like to talk about this gap that we discussed in this online course between academia and practice. Well, you have extensive experience in the field, uh, being the senior advisor to the uh, president of the RAND Corporation, uh, but also you have been the uh, advisor on aviation security, the advisor on the National Committee on Terrorism. So you have a lot of experience in, in the field of terrorism and counterinsurgency over the, over the past decades. And so we would like to hear more about how you have also experienced that work and maybe how you look at this gap between academia and practice. Maybe you even think it doesn't exist, maybe you do. But before I ask you that question, as you have also studied terrorism extensively from the 1960s and 1970s onwards, could you maybe first explain to us what you think are the major trends or developments in terrorism in the past, well, let's say, 50 years? Well, no, again, that, you know, terrorism has been with us, um, unfortunately, for a long enough time that we can see some major, major developments. I would say uh, one of the things that we, we saw first in terrorism in, in the 1970s was really its, its spread from these centers where, where terrorist uh, tactics were first used and through propagation, through imitation, it became very, very quickly a worldwide phenomenon. And so the geographic uh, spread of terrorism was one. Uh, a second development, interestingly enough, was uh, the standardization of the terrorist tactical repertoire. Um, you know, it, it, it very much settled into a handful of tactics. Uh, bombings accounted at the time, uh, bombings accounted for uh, a majority of the terrorist attacks. Uh, there were assassinations, hijackings, sabotage of, of aircraft, uh, and so on. So really, by the, by the end of the 70s, going into the 80s, there was a well-established repertoire by the terrorists themselves mm -hmm. of what they, what they did. Um, and interestingly enough, once that was standardized, in, in a sense, um, there were tactical innovations to be sure, but they were incremental innovations on, uh, on the themes that had already been identified, the tactics already identified. The, the third development I think that was important was escalation. Um, uh, a terrorists uh, uh, were, were careful about their violence in the 1970s, they wanted as I, as I wrote a number of times, terrorists wanted a lot of people watching, not a lot of people dead. Um, that was correct at the time, but it changed. As the mm -hmm. self-imposed constraints eroded, we saw a continuing escalation of, of terrorism. The, the worst incidents of terrorism in the 1970s had tens of fatalities. This escalated in the 1980s to the worst incidents had hundreds of fatalities to the 90s, it stayed in the hundreds, but there were more incidents with uh, 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 violence on, on that scale. And then of course on 9-11, it crossed into the thousands. Uh, and it led people to assume through extrapolation yeah. that we would see incidents with tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of fatalities, which we, which we have not seen fortunately. Um, Interestingly enough, after 9-11, and this brings me to the fourth trend, uh, we didn't see further vertical escalation. Instead, we saw horizontal escalation. That is, uh, again, by recruiting on the internet, by recruiting through exhortation, um, terrorist organizations were able to enlist uh, a broader um, a cut of the population, uh, they, they, they could reach more, more people. And then the final and fifth one was really a recognition of our own failure. Uh, and that is, you know, we initiated terrorism studies, not really as an academic exercise, but in order to address a, a, a global problem. Um, what, what the objective really was to prevent the normalization of terrorist tactics. And in that sense, we have failed. Uh, 
uh, terrorist tactics have been normalized. That doesn't mean that they're acceptable uh, 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 legally or, or morally. It simply means that now terrorism is a part of the political landscape. It's a part of our society. And we can try to contain it. We can try to mitigate it. But uh, uh, terrorism is now not something that we can solve. It is really mm -hmm. uh, something we have to address on a continuing basis. Yeah, interesting that you say indeed like terrorism research then came out from a more this policy oriented perspective, right? Because I just mentioned this bridge between uh, sorry, this gap between academia uh, and practice. So maybe now that you sketch this development of, of terrorism, could you say also a bit more of how you on how you experienced this gap? Or maybe it, it wasn't there because maybe it primarily started indeed as a policy oriented field of study. So so how how what is your assessment when I say a gap between academia and, and practice? Like what are your views on how that might have evolved also over the last decades? That's again. It it has its own trajectory, if you will. It clearly started out as a policy issue. There were there were no uh, there was virtually no research on terrorism, terrorist tactics in the academic world um, when we began our research in the in in the early nineteen seventies. Uh, there were no courses on terrorism. One did not get a degree in terrorism. Uh, there was a tiny amount of, of, of literature that somehow seemed relevant. Uh, there were, uh, uh, you know, a few uh, isolated scholars here and there that had, yeah. had looked at various aspects of it, but there wasn't an academic basis. You couldn't reach out to the universities and say, uh, what are you? What are you? What are you studying in in, in the realm of terrorism? It didn't exist. What happened is that the policy research, the, the policy part, was the, was the pioneer, and it ultimately raised a number of questions which could be answered by research, by yeah. by solid academic research. Um, we did some of that ourselves. Um, Certainly, uh, we saw the 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 growth of a, an academic network uh, that began to address the topic, and really contributed in a major fashion in the in the sense that, uh, in many cases, uh, a lot of the a lot of the policies, if I can say this uh, in, in in the most gentle fashion. Uh, a lot of the policies followed by governments were based upon presumptions uh, for which there was very mm. little supporting empirical evidence. Yeah. And, and, and therefore, it, it, it became critical to say, what really is the evidence telling us here? I mean, we at RAND started a chronology of, of terrorist events um, simply in order to try to get a, a handle on what was going on. Um, but a number of databases uh, were, were started in various locations. Yeah. Um, people began to look at very specific uh, types of events, um, whether it was hijackings, whether it was kidnappings, or, or so on, because these were policy-relevant issues. I, I suppose then the next step, once we saw the beginning of a uh, an academic, increased academic interest in this, is that to a certain extent, the 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 two areas, uh, this is always a, a danger, the two areas tended to somewhat mm. uh, divide, to go their own ways. The academic research became increasingly academic and interesting, fascinated to read. I, I, I can't read fast enough to cover everything that's going on in the academic community, but less relevant in many cases to the actual policy issues that we were confronting. And the, on, at the same time, the policymakers 
being politically driven in many cases were indifferent to the mm. academic production, even when it was directly relevant to policy. Yeah. And 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 so you know, um, in 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 briefing uh, members of government or testifying before uh, 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 Congress or in some foreign countries testifying before parliaments, um, you know, it, it it was very very difficult. One person told me one time said, "Well, Brian, no one was interested in what you had to say. You just were offering facts." <laughs> And, yeah. and 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 mm. so uh, yeah. you know it is a it is a continuing a uh, challenge to bring the very rich uh, field of academic research and bring it and portray it in ways that are relevant yeah. to policy. And again, many areas, I mean, one area that has attracted a great deal of academic question, uh, 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 academic interest is this issue of, of how do people radicalize? How do people radicalize themselves? What role does the internet play in this? Um, did radicalization increase with the isolation imposed by the pandemic? These are fundamental questions in, in, in our society that we're trying to deal with, the role of the internet, um, radicalization, especially as we see in many cases, I know in the United States and a number of the countries in Europe and elsewhere, the, in, the increasing political divisions in society between far left and, and far right. To understand this process has become even more critical. So there is a demand, a, a demand for the academic research to support the policy. This doesn't mean involving academics in, in you know, what is sometimes viewed as the dirty work of, of counterterrorism. And, and I'm, I'm not saying that. But at the same time, uh, to take advantage of what is very, very relevant and use it in appropriate ethical, moral ways to deal with what are major challenges yeah. in, in our society. Thanks. So thanks for sharing this, this appeal to academics also to indeed look at huh, what is relevant, um, not only academically, but also for societies. And it's fascinating to hear also how, yeah, how you look back on, on how that evolved over time and, and this gap between academia and practice. Uh, so thanks so much for sharing that with us today. Um, for those of you who are watching this online and would like to know more about the work of Mr. Jenkins, you can have a look at the publications that we listed after this video. And for now, I would like to thank you, Brian, so much for being with us today. Thank you. And, and good luck to all of you watching this in terms of your future research and whatever, whatever trajectory you take, whether it's government service or uh, remaining in academia. This is a topic of great continuing importance uh, to the world. And, and we do have to get it right. Thanks so much. We're so glad that you were here. We use your work extensively in the course, as the people know. So thanks so much and uh, good night. <laughs>